Well, if you're new, uh, you won't know me. I'm Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. I actually have been a pastor here for a while, but you wouldn't know that if you've been here for only two months because I've been gone. And so it's good to be back with you. I'm grateful for Pastor Adam, Pastor Kent, and Carrie who have labored well in, in my absence and served our family well. And we've been in a series called Basics, Cultivating Intentional Christianity. And we've been walking through just kind of the fundamentals, right? The Vince Lombardi locker room moment. Men, there's a football. We take this ball. We put it in the end zone, right? It's kind of one of those moments as a series, right? Basics, cultivating intentional Christianity. So we've been walking through some basics. So we're going to walk you through the last basic this morning of money. So number one, week one was the Bible. What was the application point? Read it. That's right. Pretty simple, straightforward. Start easy for you, right? <laughs> and I've been talking to people this week. And they're, they're like, man, I've been reading my Bible like never before. It was incredible. When Carrie told me to read it, I was like, man, I should read it. And I'm like, I've been telling you to read it for three years, you bozo. And I'm like, well... Carrie said it differently, like, oh man, Carrie's incredible, which he is, that's my younger brother, I acknowledge he is incredible. So, awesome, awesome sermon on seeing the Bible as God's word to us, and the biggest takeaway was to simply do this, read it, right? Then next week, Adam dove in with prayer, and the application takeaway from that was what? Pray. See, this is basics, right? So simple. Football, Bible, prayer, pretty straightforward, but you, you play football without an eye on the ball, you lose every game. You might win a few, but you'll lose most games. You won't win championships. You can be around Christianity, be involved in church, but you fail to cultivate a love for and a hunger for and a knowledge of the Word of God and prayer, you might win a few games, you, you won't win any championships. You gotta, we got to be men and women of, of the Word of God and men and women of prayer. Week three was community. The application point was what? Gather in it and scatter in it, right? We gather as a community to worship Jesus and we scatter in, in community to, to take the good news of the gospel and embody it to the city we live in. Week four was mission. Take away? Pursue, right? We've been pursued by God, therefore, having been saved by God for God, we pursue others. Remember Adam and Packing that uh, uh, last week? It's not as if the church has a mission line item. The mission of God birthed the church for the sake of the mission of God. So it, it, it's, not the, it's not the mission serving the church, it's the church created to serve the purpose and ends of the mission. Therefore, you, you were pursued. You didn't like stumble out and climb the hill and like crush over like, you know, I found God. No, you were blind, stupid, rebelling, lost, dead, and God pursued and found you. And then in doing so, he saved you to send you out that you might pursue lost people around you in the power of the Spirit of God with the goodness of the gospel in community with God's people. That's the church. That was last week, right? This week, basic word, Prayer, community, mission, money. And our application word for this week is what? Steward it. Okay, let's all say it together. Steward it. Now, why a sermon on money when we're talking about the basics? This seems, is this like a you know, pastor's pet peeve topic? Like why money? Here's why money in a series on the fundamentals of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. We live in a world of money. It exists and it will influence and shape the direction of your life radically and profoundly. God made it. It's his idea. And it can be used for good or evil. Money can be a blessing or a curse. Money is such a fascinating thing. Money isn't like illicit sex or drugs or name you know, you know, your, your sin we fall into. Money is this thing that was created and given by God that's good. Sex is good outside of God's covenant uh, 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 relationships of marriage, it becomes uh, destructive. Money is good, stewarded toward the purposes of God, it becomes a gift. Used outside the purposes of God, it becomes a great poison to the soul. Money can be used to purchase pornography, fund terrorism, buy drugs, purchase a prostitute, or stick you in bondage of debt forever. Or money can be used to put some clothes on a homeless person, provide for the needs of your family, build churches, or advance the kingdom. Fascinating thing this money, same $10 bill, completely different outcome based on how it is stewarded and spent and the heart behind the spender. That's why we're talking about it in a series on basics. Why else? Well, because Jesus talked about it more than any other topic, more than the word, more than prayer, more than heaven and hell combined, Jesus talked about money. Why? Because there is, there is Something about money 
that gives us an objective, measurable barometer as to where our heart is. We can say we love Jesus or we love God or I have a church every Sunday. We can say all this stuff. It's just air, right? You want to get down to the brass tacks of where your heart is and what you love and what you value and what you live for. Don't listen to what you say. Look at what you spend. And the heart can be so hard to determine where it's at. You know, that's why Jesus says, beware of greed. Jesus never said beware of adultery because you know when you're committing adultery, right? It's not like, you know, holy smokes, this isn't my wife. What was I thinking? I'm so sorry. Like, you know (laughs) when you're committing adultery. But you can be neck deep in materialism and never know it. Why? Because you can so quickly compare yourself to somebody else who's much worse than you and convince yourself you're middle of the road, middle class in America. Because there's always somebody else with a nicer car, bigger house, longer, longer vacations, more expensive clothes, nicer haircut, more expensive shoes, you know, whatever it is. And we go, well, well they're, on, they're over here. I'm not down there. I would never do that. I must be pretty good. And so we compare ourselves to those around us. And no matter how poor or rich you think you may be, in America, you will always be able to find somebody further down the line that will make you feel good about where you're at. That doesn't mean that you're in the will of God. It just means that you feel better about your idolatry. And so greed can be hard to discern. So Jesus talked about money because he said, beware of it because it will come on you and you will become like a fish that doesn't even know it's in water. And you will have succumbed to greed and materialism and covetousness. And you will depend and hope on what money can get you. And you will look to that as a savior. Therefore, Jesus talked about money a lot. He said our money and our spiritual lives are fundamentally connected it's impossible to divorce our finances from our faith. And a year ago, last fall, I was convicted of this. And we did our series, Treasure, our series on money for eight weeks. So I realized I talked about money here and there and wasn't afraid of it and didn't mind it. We talked about it, but it just didn't come up my radar a lot. And then I realized that I wasn't being Christ-like in my leadership because Jesus, the one I follow as my leadership example, talked about money one in three sermons in the Gospels. So we did our series on treasure a year ago last fall, and it was incredible for our church, and we'll, we'll see the effects of that um, here in a little bit. Money affects everything. Nobody here this morning woke up and experienced their life apart from decisions they've previously made about money and will make about money today. Everything about your ongoing experience right now is connected to money. You already made decisions this morning. Clothes you put on, shampoo you used, makeup you have or have on, breakfast you ate or didn't eat, coffee you purchased or didn't purchase, car you're driving, gas you put in that car. All of you are here, which means you're not working right now, which means you've made decisions about that income-wise. It's, it's, it's a fact of life. We're sitting in this room, and we've spent money today, and we'll spend money tomorrow. Money is the one thing that we interact with continually that God has created as a means by which we can objectively measure where our heart's at. And this is an issue you don't solve, fix just once. Like, I heard this great sermon, drove a stake, and then it's done. This is an issue you will have to resolve in your heart today, and then tomorrow, and then the next day, and then the next day, and then the next day, because you will interact with it, and it will tempt your heart towards things. And you will have to regularly come back to, what do I believe? What do I want my heart to be? What do I think is most important? Why am I wanting this right now? What, what's causing this to be a temptation? You will interact with money, and you'll make a thousand decisions, and you will succeed or fail as a steward every day in relationship to money that will radically shape who you are and, and, and your impact and your legacy for the gospel. And, and then Jesus even said, where you spend eternity? It's that big a deal. Here's a few statements. Test these and see if these aren't true. You have never spent a dime that was not spent in the pursuit of happiness. Reflect on every penny you spent this week. There was not a penny spent that was not spent in the pursuit of happiness. You say, well, you don't know my story. I I, I had to spend money on alimony this week for my crazy wife who divorced me and taking me for house and home, whatever. You paid it, didn't you? Well, yeah, but I wasn't pursuing happiness. Well, my guess is you paid it because you either want her off your back or you don't want to get the rest of them thrown in jail, and that would make you happier. So you, you, you paid money to things you didn't want to do to keep yourself more happy than would have been had you not paid it. Oh. Right? You never spend a penny that isn't in the pursuit of happiness. You never spend a penny that isn't an act of worship. You've never spent a penny that wasn't in the service of a master. When you spend money, you are 
actively, real-time, presently serving a master. You've got to think like that. A steward thinks like that. You've never spent money that wasn't in pursuit of a treasure. You've never spent money that wasn't affecting your eternity. Your life will be shaped by what you think and believe about money. And in some inescapable, inescapable way, your, your heart will wrestle with this topic of money every day the rest of your life. Money is one of those few things that can poison you if you have it and poison you if you don't have it. Now, in December, we talked about a building fund and the, the property fund and the budget need we had. We had, a, we, had a, we had a huge gap to close. It was a big deal. It was going to determine whether or not we could you know, keep the lights on, keep moving forward on mission, and purchase this property, Lord willing, we can establish a foothold in the headquarters for gospel mission for years and years and years to come. You remember, the, remember that in December? Remember that? Nod your head. Tracking. You want to know how we did? Awesome. I'll tell you at the end of the sermon. Okay. So here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we're diving in here, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, turn your Bible open there. Three questions today, what is a steward? What is a steward? If I'm called to steward my money, what does it mean to be a steward? The Bible gives us three definitions of what it means to be a steward. Number one, it's a steward is someone who understands that what they have is not theirs. You, you got to resolve this from day one, and day two, and the day after tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, you got to resolve that what I have is not my own. It's God's, not mine, and I'm a steward of it. If you take an owner mentality of what you have, I earned this, I worked for it, I deserve it. If, if that's the attitude you take, you will fail at stewardship. You will fail at being a steward. And that's going to matter to you because, number two, a steward realizes, or someone who understands, that they're responsible for it. What they have is, is not theirs, and they're responsible for it. That's the juxtaposition, that's the irony of gospel stewardship. We're called to walk in as believers. God says both globally and locally, everything is His. Mountain ranges and rivers and oceans and galaxies and stars and governments and highways and unit trees, those are His and you're His because He bought you with His blood. He owns everything globally and everything locally in your life. It's His. And if you treat what you've been given like life, like breath, like it's yours, you won't steward it rightly. You've got to realize you've been breathing air the whole time I've been talking and never thought once about it. Every breath was a gift from God. Every breath you've drawn since you got here was a gift that He's given you to steward. We don't own it. It's all His we're called to steward it. Lastly, a steward understands that they will be held responsible and they will give an account for how they stewarded what they were given. If you don't live in light of the fact that you're going to give an account for what God's given you, you will spend your money and invest your money foolishly. So foundational to understanding the biblical teaching on money is that it's not yours you're called to be responsible with it, and you will give an account for every penny spent. It's a big deal. That's, that's the worldview of a steward. That's the worldview of a steward that motivates, drives, shapes everything they do. You lose sight of that, everything else is just fog. Question number two How, how do you steward? What is a steward? Somebody who realizes that it's not theirs, they're responsible for it, and they'll give an account at the end. But how do you steward? Five things quickly, and we covered this in great detail in our series in Treasure. You can go back and listen to it, it's online. But number one, you earn it honestly. This should go without saying, right? But, you know, you, you can't steward the money you earn pole dancing for Jesus. Like, that doesn't work. You know what I mean? You can't go out and sell drugs, you know, and be a hitman for Jesus, and then take the money and think you're going to be a steward of it. You've got to start by earning it honestly, okay? Okay? Tracking on that? There is a robust biblical worldview that the Bible gives us in relationship to working hard. Christians should have a reputation for being the hardest, joy-filled, faithful workers who show up with integrity. They're the best employees you could hire. They're the best employers to work for. There is a robust theology of work shot through the, and assumed in the story of the, the gospel in the Bible that, that gives a, a, found, a worldview foundation for not just enduring work, but loving work. 
and yet not looking to work for satisfaction or identity or value or importance, but participating in it as, as, as engaging in a gift God gave to the man and the woman precursed. When you look in the garden, work was given as a gift before the fall. They were placed in the garden to work. You and I were made to work. Now, it's broken because of sin, and we look to it for identity and worth and value and all sorts of other things that, because of our broken, idolatrous heart that then destroy us and destroy those around us. But work is a gift, just like money, just like sexuality, just like family, just like breath. And stewarded as a gift and seen as a gift, it becomes something that's actually good for you. It's not good for you not to work. People who don't work, Bible is a term for them. They're lazy. Paul's got instruction for them. Don't let them eat. If they're choosing not to work, don't further their sin by, by giving them handouts. He says, let them be uh, anathema to you. Let them be put out from you. That's what Paul says. Read the Proverbs. Lots to say about the lazy man. Natural consequences built into God's world that happens when you're lazy. You don't eat. It doesn't mean we don't care for the poor. We don't care for those who, who are unable to, to, to care for themselves. But there is a lot of biblical data that point to a robust Christian ethic of work that should cause us to be the most faith-filled, faithful, integrous workers in the valley, whether we're employees or employers. Amen? Amen. Secondly, you, you, you give it generously. You earn it honestly, you give it generously. Thirdly, you save it carefully. Fourthly, you invest it wisely. And lastly, you spend it frugally. That's the grid my wife and I work through every time we go through a budget. Are we earning it honestly? Are we giving it generously? Are we saving it carefully? Are we investing it wisely? Are we spending it frugally? That's the grid we work through. Earn, give, save, invest, spend. This is a good practical grid to work through. The reason I put it this way is because most people, they do one and then they do five. The first part, not the second part of five. They earn it and then they spend it and then they, 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 they kick themselves for not investing it when they're 35 or 40 and they read all those compounding interest stories about if you put up, you know, three pennies away when you're 19 every day, you know, you, you'll be a, a quad, quadrillionaire when you're, you know, 26 or whatever. And they're like, oh, man, why didn't I do that? So now out of guilt and necessity with kids and grandkids coming, they, they start investing. They have very little to save. And then giving gets put down at number five if they have anything left over. Well, you know what? I have these obligations to debt that I've incurred with the boat and the house and the motorcycles and the whatever. And, and you know, and Lord, you know, we need a new boat acre for our boat. And Lord, I just know you want us to have that boat acre. You want our family to drift down the river and get lost and die. And I'm responsible for caring for them. And you know that Benelli shotgun, boy, I think of any birds I could harvest and feed my family if I had that new semi automatic pump shotgun. So, boy, boy, I need this. Shut up! Earn it and then give it. Then work with what's left. That's a great way to go. If you don't give of first fruits, my guess is you won't give any fruits at all. And so for us, giving gets put, comes right off the top. And we do that intentionally as a dis- disciplined act of grace to our own heart. Because if we put giving at the bottom, rarely would we get to it, if ever. And I would justify it, and I would spiritualize it, and I would excuse myself away from the obligation of it. And I would miss out on the reward God has for those who give generously and bountifully from their first fruits. I don't want to miss out on that. So it goes solidly at number two. It comes off the top, it's gross, and it's the first thing that goes out the door. And it's a way to keep my soul tender towards what I want my soul to be tender to. Jesus says, put your treasure where you want your heart to be. And I want my heart to be in the kingdom. And my heart is full of idolatry and and temptation and and, and rabbit trails that I think I need to go down. And and so to fight that, I put my money where I want my treasure to be. It becomes a means of grace that shapes what I care about. How you spend your money shapes what you care about. I, I, I can point to stories up the wazoo of people who gave lip service to Jesus but practiced putting the money where their heart was and pretty soon they're gone. They're gone. They are no longer in the kingdom of God. They have gone down the path that their treasure pulled them. This is a big deal. That's why it's basics. Read the Bible, pray, be in community, on mission, and steward your money well because it will determine greatly your eternal joy. So, generous giving is what? What does it mean to be a generous giver? Is there like a number? Is there like a ratio, a percentage, like a bar that kind of gets drawn I can jump over and, 
and, and, and, and qualifies a generous giver. 2 Corinthians 8 comes in very handy. We, we, we go here often. Super helpful text for us. If you're there, let's look at the, the, uh, a few marks that it gives us for New Testament um, generous giving. Number one, giving was celebrated publicly. Biblical, gospel, generous giving is always celebrated publicly. Chapter 8, verse 1. Here we go. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. He says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Now, what's happening here? There was this church, little church in Macedonia, and, he's, and Paul's writing a letter to the, the Corinthian church, and the Corinthian, Corinthian church had a lot of resources in a big influential city, and they were stingy. And God's saying, you're lousy advertising for the gospel because you're saying you're children of a generous father, and yet, yet you're living as stingy misers. Which, which, which reflects then on the Father. The Father isn't stingy, but you're living like it. So he's writing to them, and he's exhorting them, and he doesn't come with like some apostolic, heavy-handed, you know, you know, law-wielding beatdown. He comes with a story about the grace of God in a small church and how they gave. And then how I know that Paul valued celebrating publicly this generous giving is because verse 1, we want you to know being led by the Spirit, he's writing scripture that will be read for thousands and thousands of years by every Christian on the planet. That's pretty public, I think. I'm going to tell you and highlight for you the grace of God and their generous giving so that you might be stirred to action because of it. And here's the thing. We get this so backward in the church today. The one thing you never talk about is giving. Why? That's so dumb. Like if I walked up to you and said, like, like, how are you explaining the grace of God and give right now? Most of you would be intimidated or offended or punch me or start crying or walk out. Why? I love you. I want you to experience more joy. You give more, you get more joy. So I care about your joy, so I'm coming talking to you, and I want you to come talk to me, but why is it so taboo? Because we take words like, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, and then we spiritualize that verse and place it over our, all of our finances as an, as an excuse for no one to talk to us about it, which is stupid. I'm losing my voice because I was cheering so loudly this morning. It's stupid. <laughs> Why did that dumb? Because four verses earlier, Jesus said, let your good deeds shine before men that they may see your good works and praise your Father which is in heaven. And giving generously is a good work. We'll highlight those who have a gift of evangelism and those who have a gift of, 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 of prophecy and those who have a gift of hospitality, but we'll never highlight those who have the gift of giving. That, that's crazy. God's given people in this church like, I can't see out here, and so, but Bart Tilly in first service, and Dave Wendy Weber, and Bart and Kareen, and Jeff and Becky, and Sean and Reggie, there are many people in this church that God has given the gift of giving that we can learn from, that, that we can look to as an example to be challenged by and encouraged by, that some of you should go seek out this week and go, could you help me become what you're doing? Because I'm not, and I, and I want to get there. There should be an open door policy to your finances. I mean, I get told the craziest things in ministry. People invite me into the most sticky of, of personal, of intimate situations, embarrassing, and, and they give me full access. They come because they're in DEFCON 5, and they're stuck, and, they're, and they don't want to go, and the, and the next step is off the cliff, you know, or, or, or nuclear explosion, so they're going to talk to the pastor, get one last shot, and they let me in on all sorts of crazy details I never wanted to know about would have never asked them for. I get access to all kinds of stuff, and yet not once in 15 years of ministry, and Dad's got 32, I ask him first service, he's the same thing. Not one person has ever come and asked me how to handle their finances in a godly way. What in the world? Why would we not do that? Because how you spend your money is a very intimate thing because it reveals your heart. And so to be safe and protect the idols closest to us, we hide it and we spiritualize it and then we safely go on our way while cancer is rotting our soul all the way down the road. There should be an open book policy to your finances that would breathe life into it. Sharon and I go through our budget every year and we'll ask Adam or Ken or my dad or Bart Tilly this year, other guys, hey, would you look at this? We want our treasure to be where our heart is. We set this as our giving, our, our giving uh, 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 floor. We want, we want to be above that. Would you look and see, does this look like a steward a budget to you? Does this look like faithfulness to you? Could you speak into this? We do that all the time. Why? Because I realize what I've been given is not my own, so I got nothing to lose, right? I'm responsible to steward it, and I'm going to be given account for it. Why would I not ask someone to speak into it? You have nothing to lose except joy. I haven't got one amen yet. Thank you. I think that's pretty good. 
And you start talking about opening your books to other people to see, and whew, it gets real quiet. <laughs> Proving my point that money should be talked about in a series on basics. Right? Come on, folks. It's not yours. It's not yours. You're responsible for it, and you, the books will be open one day. And it won't be your pastor or your buddy or your friend. It'll be Jesus, King Jesus, looking at your books. You've got to live with that kind of reality. Sharon and I set a floor, 12% giving last year. We just did our books, 16% gross off the top. We gave it to GCC last year. We're like, yeah, laying in bed that night going, man, I wish I could have given more. What can we do to make more? Let's go talk to Bart. I mean, we have never given a penny to the work of the gospel that we've regretted. Not one penny. We've bought lots of other stuff that, that we're like, why did we buy that again? Or we just forget we got it. Or just down the rat hole, right? You will never, never give a penny to the work of the gospel and the kingdom advancement that you will regret. So invite people to speak into it, right? To speak into it. We want to grow every year. That, 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 that's our goal. Because we want our money to be where our, we want our heart to, to go. Because frankly, the, 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 the rate at which my heart grows idols in my heart would blow your mind. And one of the ways I can fight that is to where, where we give our resources. That's what, maybe challenge something this week. Open your books up. Invite counsel to speak into it because public, generous giving should be celebrated publicly. And when it's hidden, lots of room for error. Number two, generous giving was joyful. Look at uh, verse two. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty. Now, what do you think is going to finish that sentence, right? In America, it would be like, because a severe test of affliction, you know, like, like their, their, their fourth car broke down, and they didn't have winter tires, and, um, you know, uh, they couldn't buy the latest edition of whatever, and in their extreme poverty, uh, it resulted in them not being able to give much to the kingdom work that year. That's how most American versions of a church would, would have to end that sentence. Paul says, in a severe test of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Isn't that awesome? Their giving was joy-filled. Two things to note. Their giving transcended difficult circumstances, and their giving was not hindered by their poverty or low economic status. No excuses for giving here. Extreme difficult environmental circumstances, poverty, resulted in an overwhelming giving, an overwhelming flow of generosity rising out of their heart, not based on circumstances, because their giving was connected first vertically to God, not horizontal, horizontally to circumstances. They weren't responding to horizontal windfalls of money where then they can give a little bit that won't hurt, but you know, throw, throw God a bone to get the, the guilt pastor off my back so I can go spend the money what I want to spend it on. It was, we're giving out of what we don't have because we're responding to the grace of God we've received vertically, disconnected from how whatever's going on horizontally. There was a sense of joy in their giving that was contagious. Number three, generous giving was proportionate. Look at verse three. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify. They gave according to their means, as I can testify. Meaning, to be a, a person filled with the Spirit of God and giving as an, a response to grace, you're not giving like a flat club fee. You know what I mean? It's not like the Bible says, like, well, we're going to set this, this kind of flat uh, club fee that's going to be just above middle class to make sure that we can get some, you know, we can challenge the upper middle class, let the, let the, let the regular middle class jump over the line, and then keep those poverty folks out of there because we don't really like to hang around them. No, no, no. This is proportionate to what they had. I mean, if they had lots, they could give lots. If they had little, they give what they have. God's not looking at how much you've given. He's looking at how much you've kept for yourself. It's not, okay, I'll give 10% to God and leave 90% for myself. It's all of it is God's. How can I best steward it for his purposes? Don't create these false dichotomies where some of it is God's and some of it is yours. You're giving explicitly to him off the top a percentage of your money to, to signify and represent how you should see the rest of the percentage you kept. It's all his. You've been given responsibility for it, and you will give an account of how you stewarded it. So Sharon and I, we started, we said 10%, boom, that's where we start. That's where we're going to start. That, that's where we're going to start as the floor to grace giving, not the ceiling to the law giving. 
Because we've, we've been called to give in response to what we've been given. And we've been given from God more grace than like 10%. He sent his son Jesus who gave his own very life. That's more than 10%. That's everything. And so we want to give in response to that. It's joy-filled it, 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 and it's proportionate to what God's given you. Not a flat club fee. Number four, generous giving is sacrificial. Look at verse four, or verse three. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means they gave. Don't you love that? They gave according to their means, and then they gave beyond their means. Meaning, if you're not giving in such a way that's, that's stinging a little bit personally, you're probably not in line with New Testament giving. It wasn't like, well, I can give this much, and that'll be a lot and impress the, the bookkeeper, but this allowed me to maintain this, this level of comfort. It was giving out of an overflow of generosity. You know, Mark 12, 41 is the story of the widow's might, and, and it's a picture of these, these uh, self-righteous Pharisees walking through, and then, you know, ching you know, keys to their, their fifth escalade. You know, cha-ching, you know, you know $10,000 check they pulled out of their pocket, you know, they found on the couch at home, you know. Uh, swipe the credit card, cha-ching. And then the, the, the widow comes up. She goes, plum, plum, two, two pennies. And Jesus says, hey, disciples, pay attention. Who just won in the kingdom? Not the person that gave for the show that at the end of the day really cost him nothing. The person who gave out of their poverty and cost him everything. That's gospel giving. That's giving that comes when you've experienced the gospel of Jesus Christ who had everything and left it all to make himself nothing. That those who have nothing might be given everything and then live like it. When we have such a generous father and live like stingy children, we're not good missionaries. We have a generous father who's given us all he had that we might receive and become inheritors of all he has. We should spend our money like it. Sacrificial giving. C.S. Lewis said, I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words... If our expenditures on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. If our charities and giving habits do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we want to do and cannot do because our giving expenditures exclude them. Now, I read that, and I just fear that guilt will come, well, guilt will come over you. I don't want a penny given out of guilt. What, what is that? I want you to see that there is more joy to be had in giving than keeping and spending on yourself. You can't outspend and purchase for yourself the joy and reward God has for you when you live generously with what he's given you. You just can't. God doesn't prosper you to raise your standard of living. God prospers you that you might raise your standard of giving. Now, now hear this, hear this, I am not against making money. I think every person here is obligated to use the resources God's given them to make as, absolute, as much money as possible. I have no problem with that. Zero problem making money. I love men and women who've been given the gift of making money. God's concerned with what you do with what you've made. Right? What you do with what you've made. It's not how much you make. Oh, if you make, if you make $12 million a year, you're a sinner. No, that's awesome. Praise God. Now, now what are you doing with it? What are you doing with the bounty God's given you? Number five, New Testament generous, grace-filled giving is, is, is voluntary. Look at verse three. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own free will. Not Paul flexing his apostolic muscles and doing a beat down with a law stick. This is in response to grace. Not trying to please the pastor or, or meet some you know, club fee. This is the response to grace of their own free will. No obligation, all worship. Number six, generous giving was a privilege. Verse four, and they begged us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Now, I call this 12th man giving. This is 12th man giving, okay? This isn't like I give because I have to, because I feel guilty and bad. I want to appease my, my conscience. This is like, can I play? Can I give? Can I be on the team? Can I wear the jersey? Please, please, please. I love this team. I love this game. I love our quarterback. I love our chances. I want to participate. That's kind of giving that's going on here. Are you a 12th man giver? I got the stat this week. I read in an article. It was crazy. Three, the city of Phoenix will increase its population by 350,000 people this weekend. Now, that's a significant influx of population. That's like, what, 10 times the size of Wenatchee? Something like that. Am I doing my math right? 
like, like of people like landing in one place for one weekend. Now, how many people can they fit in the stadium? I don't know, 60,000, 80,000 maybe, 80,000. They can't fit 350,000 people, which means there is a large, the larger percentage of people going to Phoenix aren't going because they get to go to the game, because most of them couldn't afford the ticket. They're going just to be in the city when their team wins the Super Bowl. <laughs> That's ridiculous, I think. I'm going to be home watching on a huge screen. <laughs> they drove or taxied or bust or flew down. They spent money just to be at the tailgate party watching on their little screen and listen to the cheering going on in the stadium next to them so they could be in proximity to their champions when they take home the trophy. That's 12 man giving. That, that's, that's just kind of given here. Begging and begging to give so they could be a part of the trophy that will be won by their champion, King Jesus. I love the unifying effect of a champion. You know what I mean? Everyone's like, we're going to win it this year. We're, we're, gonna, we're going for a two-peat. You know, we're going, we're going, we're going. I'm like, you're not going to do it. You, you, you sit on the couch and eat Doritos. Russell Wilson's going to win it. You know what I mean? All this corporate we language is hilarious. The unifying effect that a champion has on a group of people is profound. And it echoes the reality of the church. We have the greatest champion to ever take the field. And we're going to win. <laughs> Meaning he's going to win. And we get to celebrate it. Are you that kind of giver? Are you a 12th man giver? Please let me participate. I want to be able to say I was a part of that. The funny thing is, every 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 fan in the stadium thinks they're a difference maker, right? They're screaming top runs, and they're and they're, they're like, "I'm going to be the one that that is the decimal difference maker that allows Aaron Rodgers not to hear the snap, right?" And yet, if you remove any one of those fans, nobody misses them, right? But they're screaming like they're the difference maker. When that football snapped over Peyton Manning's head last, last year, I mean, there was a 12-man roar. We did that! Yeah! Well, maybe. <laughs> right? Right? That's how you should give. If your proportionate sacrificial giving is, is 200 bucks a month to the work of the gospel, you should feel like you're the, difference, the decibel difference-making screamer at Seahawks Stadium. Every follower of Jesus should feel like they're participating in the greatest championship game ever to be played in the universe. And all they want to do is figure out a way to get down to where it's all happening so they can be there when it goes down. That's New Testament generous giving, right? Are you a 12th man giver? Are you a Jesus giver? Number seven, New Testament generous giving is an act of worship. Look at verse 5. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God they gave to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should com complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in speech, in faith, in knowledge, in all earnestness and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Giving is an act of obedience, it's an act of faith, and it's an act of worship in response to God, not a guilt trip from a pastor. I have more confidence in kingdom resources I can get out of you if I point you to King Jesus than if I trip you with a guilt. No question in my mind. Because Jesus is amazing and good and big and glorious. And if you see him and if you check out his stats and if you watch a few of his highlight reels, you will be a fan for life and you'll be 12th man giver. Because the giving that pleases the heart of God isn't giving that is in response to horizontal leveraging, but, but vertical grace received. It's not even necessarily giving that responds to the need of humanity, but giving that flows out of the grace received by God. This was not giving done to, for the approval of man. This was giving done for the approval of God. Giving that pleases the heart of God is an act of worship. Generous 
New Testament grace-filled giving is systematic discipline. Look at verse 10. And in this matter, I give my judgment. This, meaning giving, benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. See the the order there? (laughs) You didn't necessarily want to, but you disciplined your heart to do so, and it's now changed what you desired. Meaning it was an, an intentional, purposed, planned, disciplined, systematized act of faith that's resulting in gospel desires now that maybe you didn't have when you started, but came about as you faithfully pursued what you knew God's called you to in faith. That's why Paul calls the obedience of the New Testament the obedience of faith. It's the obedience of faith. It's obedience that, that wells up from faith and, and, and hinges on faith. I'm following Jesus in this matter, believing that obedience to him is better for me and result in more happiness for me than I were to receive if I were to go the path I want to take that currently looks as if it would be more, more fun. But I'm going to, in faith, submit to the word of God, trusting what he says, even if I can't see how it all shakes out yet. Giving the honor God is systematic discipline. Verse 11, so now finish doing it well so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Meaning this, make a plan, follow through. Study hard, ask for conviction, ask the Lord to give you the desires of what you should desire, and then when you are experiencing moments of what I call holy lucidness, when you recognize you're in a moment with the Spirit of God, or with your pastor, or with someone in your gospel community, or in a DNA moment, or with a brother and sister, or your spouse, when you realize you're seeing things clearly as you ought, and you're seeing things as God's designed them to be, and as he's called you to walk, in that moment, you drive a stake of commitment So that when you get into the fog of war at Hooked on Toys with a new Benelli shotgun, you won't get swept away. Now, I'm just using personal examples here. I don't know what your thing is, okay? But you go there and you're like, oh, man, is that the new Benelli for me? Could I have the whole here? And this is nice. This feels really good. You know what? I could see myself being a steward of God's money and needing this for kingdom purposes. (laughs) I don't know. I'll figure it out. I'll justify it somehow. And I'm in a storm of temptation, right? I need the anchor holding me or I'll get lost in the storm. Now, if you own a couple of shotguns, that's no, that's no problem at all. If you feel the need to give one away, you, this might be a moment the Lord's talking to you right now. I don't know. Just throw it out there. You pray about it. You pray about it. But I um, just want to get that in there. <laughs> First Corinthians 16, Paul said this. Now, concerning the collection of the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. In other words, giving is something that should be done regularly. Many Christians have good intentions to give. They simply never discipline themselves to give. And I don't think it'll cut it as an excuse in facing Jesus if you say, I really wanted to, but every time I went to find a pen to write a check, I mean a really generous check, I couldn't find one. You know how hard it is to find a pen when you're actually washed in Jesus? <clears throat> no, you don't? Okay, never mind. <laughs> right? Discipline your heart towards the things of God or your idolatrous heart might pull you off track. So Sharon and I, we, we, we set, I guarantee you, had we not set a baseline, we would have never hit where we went this year. Had we said, well, we want to give a lot when we can, as we're able, it just wouldn't happen because I'm just that much of a, of, of, of a, of a sinner. And it might not even be intentional sin, conscious, it might just be unconscious laziness and unfaithfulness. Steward your money, people, whether you make a thousand bucks a month or fifty thousand bucks a month or two hundred thousand bucks a month. God's called you to steward it because it's not yours. You better get a plan. You better get a plan for every penny that you will be held accountable for. Make a plan. I guarantee you, those who, who make a plan will give more than those who, who intend to give a lot but never get around to it. That's why giving goes right at the top. We earn it, and then we give it. If we left giving to what we had when we were left over, or or we're going to give when we feel moved by the Spirit, guess what? Statistics show most of you don't feel moved by the Spirit very often. Which means either Jesus doesn't, Jesus the Spirit doesn't care about moving the church forward, or you're not listening well. Discipline yourself towards what you want to do. Unless giving is... 
systematically done, it is rarely substantially fruitful. Number nine, generous giving expresses our interdependence as the body of Christ. Look at verse 13. I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at this present time should supply their needs so that their abundance may supply your need, that, they may be, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. What's the point? There are enough kingdom resources in, in, within the storehouse of God's people to get the work that he's called us to do. That's the point. And there may be church planting missions that are on the front line of kingdom work where there are no resources yet that we have been called to fund. That's why we set aside 10% to church planting right off the talk from the corporate church budget. We practice radically corporately what we call all of you to practice radically individually. And so there are frontline churches uh, in, in the state of Washington and in the region of the Northwest and around all p- parts of the world that are, are doing frontline gospel seed sowing where there's young people or college students or unbelievers or new believers and they have little resources to give or they don't know they're supposed to give yet because they're still in the discipleship process. And we, who have resources here, fund those work on the front lines so that they might grow in strength. And one day if we're in need, they can meet our need. It's the give and take and interdependence of the body that's beautiful creates a picture of interdependency that is beautiful and models the reality of the kingdom. And lastly, number 10, generous giving brings reward. Look at chapter 9, verse 6. Just unblushing reward. Chapter 9, verse 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. What's the promise there? You give a little, you get a little back. You give a lot, you get a lot back. Where we miss it is we say, if I, if I give a lot, I better get a beamer back. Or if I give a lot, I better get a promotion back. Or if I give a lot, I better get health back. Baloney. Give a lot and look for kingdom return on your investment, not material return on your kingdom investment. God promises unblushing, radical reward for those who give generously and significantly to the work of the kingdom. The, the prosperity gospel says this, give in order to get blessing. Give in order to get spiritual, or excuse me, physical blessing. Gospel theology of giving says give, and that is the blessing in itself. As a means of grace to keep your soul saved, and as a means to help you participate in cheering on the champion on the field. Give, giving brings reward. Look at verse 7. Each one must give as he has made up his own mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Meaning, there is more work to be done in your heart in this area than I can do for you right now. This isn't come to church, have Josh draw the line for me, and I'll walk up to that line, and then I'll, have, I'll, I'll give it the office, and I'll have done my duty for the day. No, 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 no. More work than that. You go home, and in the quietness of your heart, wrestle with the living God as to how he's called you to respond to his grace in your life. That's what you're called to do. I don't do that for you. Adam doesn't do that for you. Ken doesn't do that for you. Some presbytery or bishop or ecclesiological authority. No, no, no. You do that in the quietness of your heart with your spouse or your mom and dad or your friend or or accountability partners. You give it for God and go, how would you have me respond to your grace in my life? Get each giving according to what he's made up in his mind to do in the presence of God, steered by his conscience, because God loves a cheerful giver, not an obligatory giver. If you leave here guilt-ridden and start cutting checks to GCC, stop. Jesus wants a cheerful giver. Don't excuse yourself from not giving because you think it won't make you happy. And don't appease your conscience by giving obligatory checks to God's work and thinking you've given it the opposite can move on. No, he wants more than your check. He wants your heart. You give from a place of response and worship to God and then look out. Look out, because God promises. Look, verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Verse 10, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all your generosity, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. All right, you see, it's still plain here. When, you're, when you give, he will bless, not for the sake of personal material gain, but for the purpose and sake of doing more giving. God sees those who are faithful seed sowers, and he gives more seed to those who sow seed. He just does. 
And so when you give, you're giving like, Lord, this is what we can do now before you. Our, our conscience is clear and the, and the godly counsel we've been given and, and obligations covered and being responsible is what we can give. We'd love to give more, Father. It's what, it's what we can give. But would you bless us so we can give more? And I, I'm telling you, we talk about the church all the time. I sit down and, and we talk in the budget and how should we spend and this and that, whatever. And, and we talk about all the time. Gentlemen, let us not do with God's money but we would be ashamed to stand before him and give an account for it when that day comes. That's kind of a way on you when you do your books this month. And then we say, gentlemen, let us not spend money in a way which we would not be proud of our people to do. Let us not do corporately what we would call nobody to do independently. Let us do corporately what we're calling them to do public, independently, and let us be an example as a church for how we're calling the individual members of the church to live And would God give us the grace to steward his resources in a way that he would go, okay, they're a good investment of resources. I'm telling you, GCC, I want Jesus to look down and go, okay, they're worth giving more resources to because they steward it well for my purposes. We're going to open the valve up a little more for those folks. You want that? No, I don't want that. So, Land a plane. Bottom line is this. Generous giving is motivated and rooted in the worship of Jesus as an overflow in response to the gospel. Therefore, it is at the center of what it means to be Christian. Hope, faith, love. The grace of these is love. At the center of Christianity is, is a heart of giving. If you don't give, it's probably because you lack faith. If you don't give, it's probably because you're hoping in something other than Jesus. And if you don't give, you can give lip service to love, but you don't back up the resources to meet the needs of those you say you love, you don't love. Faith, hope, love. At the center of Christianity. Love the Lord your God, our house, our mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do either of those unless you're stewarding your money toward the purposes of God. You can't be a Christian. You can't follow Jesus unless you deal with this issue of money. Paul says it right here. Look at chapter 8, verse 8. Or verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Here's the point. Giving is not something over here on the side of Christianity. It's at the heart of Christianity because it, it, it gives you a barometer for measuring how much grace you're seeing and experiencing in your life from Jesus.